We need someone to operate the video camera. We need a greeter. We need counters. We need probably several other things, right, Sarah? She's done. Um, I think there may be all listed in the bullet. If you or if you know someone who could help us with some of those things, um, I know that sometimes it's hard, especially in the summer when people go away, but we need those roles filled. And just a word again about the protocols that we are following. Um, your leaders here at Trinity care about you, and that's why we're following the suggested guidelines of wearing masks, um, cleaning hands, sitting distance apart. You've heard that over and over and over, I'm sure. Uh, but that's why we're following those things here. If it was up to me, I would put everything back the way it was and run up and hug all of you. But I'm not doing that on purpose out of, um, as it says, an abundance of caution. We've heard that phrase a lot. A friend of mine says it like this, we are living in extraordinary times. And I guess that's true, and it does call from us an extraordinary faith to match it. And we need to pray and join together in spirit. As a community, we can be together in spirit, even if not physically present. So that community still continues to be a gift. So without anything else, let's worship. We begin with words of confession and forgiveness. And if you choose to stand, that is fine. Um, I, it doesn't say anywhere here where people are typically supposed to stand, so stand where you're comfortable. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are not to sin. We cannot free ourselves. Yes. We have sinned against you in thought or word and deed. I have what we have done. Wild 
flowers bloom When the farewell hymn shall be chanted I will rest by her side in the tomb
Through symbolic action, Jeremiah insisted that Judah and all the surrounding nations should submit to the king of Babylon. Hananiah contradicted the word of Jeremiah, who in reply insisted that Hananiah's rosy prediction should not be believed until it came true. God confirmed the word of Jeremiah and sentenced the false prophet Hananiah to death. First reading is from Jeremiah chapter 28, starting with the fifth verse. The prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. Sin is an enslaving power which motivates us to live self-serving, disobedient lives. Sin's final payoff is death. We, however, have been set free from sin's slavery to live obediently under God's grace, whose end is the free gift, free of eternal life. Second reading is from Romans chapter 6. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer pre present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. 
So what advantage did you get then from things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends the reading. This next song um, is just a simple song I'd like to sing for you. And since we don't have an actual offering until on the way out, I'd like to just have us think about these words and what Christ did for us and what we will offer back to him. Surprise! Living as a Christian 
in this complicated world means having a big advantage in life. It means life is a surprise. It means listening to an inner voice of love, tuning one's ear and heart to a different sweet melody, living a caring life, not needing to hurry and take up a brutal pace because you know deep down that you are loved. I heard a song way a long time ago in my childhood, which is probably before most of you, a song that speaks of this inner life that says this, in my heart there rings a melody. Anyone learned that in Sunday school? In my heart there rings a melody, a melody of heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody of love. Even though it's a children's song, I think it holds a great truth. That when we are living in an awareness of grace, with grace and control of our lives, that there is a new master. There's a sweet voice that we listen to within. Now you've found that you don't have to listen to what sin tells you to do. You've discovered the delight of listening to God. And you receive a whole, healed, put-together life right now. This kind of life, this life of freedom, is what Paul had in mind when he wrote this letter to the Romans. And these people that he was writing to were new to this way of life. They had lived, well, worshiping the gods, whatever they were in Rome at that time. And so this being transferred to a life of grace was totally new. And so Paul was trying to explain what it, what it meant. Paul states that when we are in Christ, we live with a different tune. We live free under the control of grace. The life and death and resurrection of this man who was God gets placed deep within our souls and makes us new. We can ignore that reality, but that would be foolish because there's such great delight in listening to God and in letting go of all the other voices. Paul spoke out of his own experience. At one point, he was living a life of hatred. If you know his story from Acts, at one point, his goal was to rid the world of followers of Jesus. We're told in Acts chapter 9 that he would breathe out threats and hatred to people. But then he had an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He was knocked down and overcome with the power of God's love. Paul had no other response than to completely acknowledge this divine light. There wasn't anything he could do. The force was so strong, it pushed all the hate right out of him. And he was forever filled with a new joy and purpose to tell the world about Christ. It was a life for him of total surprise, completely different than what he had in mind. After this encounter on the road to Damascus, Paul's life would never have dead ends like it mentions in that reading. His life was an adventure from then on. Maybe you've had an encounter or a situation in your life that's shifted you completely from whatever it was you were doing before to a life of grace. Sometimes people have those dramatic encounters. There's nothing like it, breathing fresh air after wandering a long dead path for many years. When the new master grace takes over, it truly becomes a life of surprise and joy. You probably already know this story, the famous story of the man who wrote the famous hymn, Amazing Grace, John Newton. John Newton was a slave trader in the 1700s and probably uh, wrote over 200 hymns. The famous, the famous, of course, Amazing Grace is probably the best known hymn of all time. But the real story and maybe you've heard his story, but there's some subtleties in his life story that make it a little interesting. There was a movie made of his life, I think in 2006, and also a musical. But there's a few other things to know. He was born in 1725 in London to a mother who was a Puritan and a father who was a sea captain who took him to sea at age 11. After a reckless youth of a lot of drinking, 
Newton joined the British Navy. After attempting to desert the Navy, he was beaten and reduced to the rank of common seaman. While later serving on a slave ship, that's where he was assigned, Newton didn't get along with the crew, and they left him in West Africa with a slave trader. During the voyage back to England, the ship was caught in a horrendous storm off the coast of Ireland, and the crew thought that that was the end of them. Newton began to pray. Somehow, the cargo shifted to fill a hole in the ship's hull, and the vessel drifted to safety. From then on, Newton began to worship this God that he didn't really know. And he counts that as his change of life. He didn't radically change all of his ways of life, though. His reforming was more gradual. He said this, I cannot consider myself to have been a believer in the full sense until a considerable time afterward. He did, though, begin reading the Bible and began to view his captives with a different, with a different view. After returning to England, Newton and his girlfriend, Mary Catlett, dramatically confronted the Prince of Wales and urged him to abolish the cruel practice of slaving. In real life, Newton continued to sell his fellow human beings, making three more voyages as captain of two different slave vessels. In 1754, he suffered a stroke and retired. In 1764, he was ordained as an Anglican priest, but it wasn't until 1772 that he wrote his famous hymn. But this is interesting. It wasn't until 1788, 34 years after leaving the slave trade, that he actually began to speak publicly and to really denounce it. He wrote a pamphlet called Thoughts Upon the Slave Trade, in which he describes the actual horrific conditions on slave ships. And he makes a public statement. It will always be a subject of humiliating reflection to me that I was once an active instrument in a business at which my heart now shudders. This pamphlet was so popular it was reprinted and sent to every member of parliament. And then you probably know the history. It was in 1807 that England outlawed slavery legally, and Newton lived to see it, and he died in December of that year. Newton had a change of life early in his life, but it wasn't for 30-some years later that he wrote clearly about the horrendous practice that he was involved in. And then he says of himself, my heart now shudders. It's sad to me that it was such a very long time between his new life and grace and his outcry against the horrors of what he was involved in. I wonder why he was so afraid to speak about it. His words were powerful when he did write that pamphlet. The words went to Parliament, and it did end in Action England, outlawing slavery in 1807. What if he had spoken out louder sooner? I wonder if it would have made a difference. What this says to me is that living under grace isn't just something that happens in an instant. It takes time. We learn and we listen to that sweet melody. And slowly we listen to it more and more and more. And it does change us. And so it becomes true. What a surprise. A whole healed, put together life is ours right now. And more and more life on the way. Life under grace means becoming aware more and more every day of the small wonders that God surrounds us with. Life under grace is a gift, but it's also a gift that we cooperate with so that we can hear that voice, so we can see more of those wonders day after day. The more we live under it and respond to it, the more it comes to us. I think of it as sort of a river. It doesn't cascade over us, but the farther we walk out into it, the more we feel its flow. Where do you see it in your life? It's the force that helped you get out of bed this morning and enter the new day. 
Maybe it's the patience that you need to listen to a family member explain a difficult situation. Maybe it's the gratitude that wells up to you when you are just grateful for life. I have a good friend who grew up in a very, very, a very um, difficult family life, and she would say later in her life, I'm just glad to be alive. I'm just grateful for life. She was filled with so much joy just for living. I wonder how much we really understand this new call in the life of grace. Imagine sometimes what could happen if we really opened our eyes to it more and more every day. Imagine what could happen if all of the church, from the loud Pentecostals to the quieter Lutherans and everyone in between, would join of one mind to pray for an end to this horrendous virus instead of talking about it all the time like we all do. I wish this and I wish that and I wish this. Just imagine if the whole church could gather together and instead of debating, just bring it before God. I wonder if it would go away. Just think. What a surprise! A whole healed, put together life right now with more and more life on the way. Today, take time. Be grateful for those things around you. Take time to pray. Take time to thank God for this wonderful, whole, healed, put together life that we have all been given. Even though we can't sing, um, we certainly can read the words and uh, they're awesome words, so stay uh, paying special notes to them.
Come into unity with one another and the whole creation. Let us pray for our shared world. God of love and care, we pray that you would accompany all those who are in deepest need. Bring comfort to those who are sick this day, or lonely, or abandoned. We pray especially for those who are listed Vera, Sue, Diet, Harriet, Kathy, Becky, Sloan, Dan, Chris, and Robbie, and Angela. We pray for those who are working in the healthcare field, for all those who are caring for the sick and caring for the needs of us all. Renew the spirits of all who call upon you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of mercy, your grace is poured out for all of us. Help us to walk into the river of life and grace that you set before us. Today we pray that you would continue to surround our government leaders, authorities, politicians, judges, all our leaders to act with compassion. Teach us to overcome fear with hope, to meet hate with love, and to welcome one another as we would welcome you. Here is our God. God of love, you gather into your embrace all those who have died. Today we remember those many people who have died of this horrible virus. And we pray together that you would hear our prayers and that there would be a soon end to it. We pray as well for those in our congregation who are dealing with grief, especially Kelly, whose grandmother and aunt died just this week. Keep us steadfast in our faith. Renew our trust in your promise. Hear us, O God. Receive these prayers, O God, and those within our hearts that are too deep for words through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Take a moment to greet one another with a non-touching greeting and <laughs> peace. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever.